First World War dismantled empires and birthed nation states across Europe and the Middle East. Vague promises were made to the Kurdish people during treaty negotiations after the war, but were not kept. The emerging state of Turkey was too strong, and the victorious British and French were more interested in dividing former Ottoman territory between themselves than in securing Kurdish autonomy. By the time the Treaty of Luzon was signed in 1923, establishing many of today's borders in the Middle East, the prospects of a Kurdish state appeared to have vanished. The Kurds' traditional homeland, known as Kurdistan, was split between Turkey, Iran, and Syria, which was controlled by the French, and Iraq, controlled by the British. But Kurdish dreams of nationhood persisted, and nationalist movements and uprisings aimed at autonomy, or outright independence, flared in all four countries, none with any lasting success. The worst violence occurred in Iraq during a period of Kurdish rebellion in the 1980s. Saddam Hussein's al Anfal campaign involved the murder of some 100,000 Kurdish non-combatants. His forces razed hundreds of villages, and in the city of Halabja, they killed 5,000 civilians with poison gas. Real progress towards Kurdish statehood, when it came, was accidental, a side effect of the first Gulf War in 1991. After Saddam's army was expelled from Kuwait, Iraq's Kurds and Shias rose up against him, in part because then-American President George H.W. Bush had encouraged them to do so. At first, America was unwilling to help the Kurds, but it was shamed into protecting them from future retaliation by Saddam. Along with Britain and France, it established a no-fly zone in northern Iraq to keep the Iraqi military out. The Kurds took advantage of their new autonomy to build a state. They flew the Kurdish flag, not the Iraqi one, established a parliament, held elections, and educated their children in Kurdish instead of Arabic. Their project took another leap forward in 2003, when an American-led coalition toppled Saddam for good. The Americans didn't invade Iraq to advance Kurdish independence, but that's what happened. As the rest of Iraq descended into civil war, Iraqi Kurdistan flourished. It was safe. Construction cranes filled its skylines, building shopping malls and universities. Foreign countries opened consulates in Erbil, the Kurdish capital. Iraqi Kurdistan might have continued on this quasi-autonomous path for years to come, but in 2014, the so-called Islamic State swept through much of Iraq capturing the country's second largest city, Mosul, and threatening Erbil. The Islamic State murdered thousands of Kurdish Yazidi men and boys, and sexually enslaved thousands of women and girls. The Iraqi army fled. The Kurds' armed forces, known as Peshmerga, did not. For the Kurds, this underscored Iraq's weakened state and the threat it still posed to their safety. The Kurds' stand against the Islamic State also resulted in a wave of foreign support. An international coalition is now battling the Islamic State in cooperation with Iraqi and Kurdish forces. Canada is one of several nations providing the Kurds with military aid and training. This may present Iraq's Kurds with an opportunity to take their next steps towards nationhood. Masoud Barzani, president of the Kurdistan regional government, makes no secret of his desire for Kurdish independence. He says he will hold a non-binding referendum by November, but numerous obstacles remain. Iraqi Kurdistan's neighbors are likely to oppose its independence, and its Western allies are officially committed to Iraqi unity. Kurdish nationalists counter this by saying, a unified Iraq exists only on maps. Iraq is collapsing, they argue, while they are creating a real country. They are closer to realizing that goal than at any other time since the end of the Ottoman Empire almost a century ago.